We left off in Deuteronomy chapter 32. I had planned to finish chapter 32. It didn't happen. And I was actually planning on finishing Deuteronomy this evening, and it probably won't happen. <laughs> but we're going to pick up in chapter 32, verse 15. Let, let's let's kind of get caught up into what's happening in the 32nd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is about to leave the scene. Moses had been one of the um, great prophets of the, of the Old Testament. Up until this point, uh, Moses is... Um, the friend of God. That, that, that's how he's described. He's, he talked to God face to face. And this man is about to leave the scene. And before he does, he's going to give a warning to the nation of Israel. He's going to give, a, a, and, and he's teaching them a song. Actually, God said, Moses, I want you to write a song. I want you to teach that song to the children of Israel because it's going to be a testimony against them whenever they rebel against me. And so God is, is uh, instructing Moses to write this song. And we got about halfway through or maybe a little less than halfway through as the first four verses talked about the character of God. That God is a faithful God. That he was a rock. That he was perfect. His work is perfect. His ways are just, it tells us in, in verse 4 there. And that he's a God of truth and well, without any injustice. You, you see, the character of God is flawless. And this is the, the, the emphasis that, 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 that Moses was opening up this song with. He's reminding us who God is. And then verses 5 all the way to verse 14 mention God's faithfulness to the children of Israel. That God had been faithful all the way through their journeys. Everything that they had experienced out of bondage and slavery, 40 years in the desert, God had provided for them, protected them, sustained them gave them victory over their enemies and God had, had, had given them uh, just provisions that only God could provide. And as we come to verse 15, and we started verse 15, and we got to back up a little bit because it don't make sense unless we begin back in verse 15. And he says to Jeshurun, which is another name for Israel. The, the, the idea is the upright ones. The, the, these are the ones that God had made his own to Jeshurun. But Jeshurun grew fat and they kicked. You grew fat and you grew thick. You are obese. Now, you know, we, we mentioned it last God's not trying to shame them. Because you bunch of fatties. That's not what God's doing here. I mean, you, you see, I understand something. It, it really, whenever, we're, we're in a weird culture here in America. You see, to be skinny is something good. You go to third world country, and if you got a little bit of extra weight on you, that means you've been eating good. You've been blessed. <laughs> I, I remember going to South America and, and, you know, had a couple extra pounds, and they're like, you know, you really blessed. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. <laughs> You've been really blessed, right? And it, it's, it's incredible because in a country where people are hungry, if, you, if you're eating good, that, that, that's a sign of wealth. And what, what's interesting is that God's saying, you guys become so comfortable. You, you, you've been so blessed that you have forsaken me. And it's always the danger, guys, when, you know, it, it, it's... It's our tendency. Whenever, whenever we're going through trials and tribulations, we can cry out to God, you know, God, help. But whenever everything's going good and we have an abundance, our tendency is to kind of put our confidence in ourselves, our attention on other things. That's what God had warned them. Let me, let me read back to you in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We, we had... Um, covered this months ago, but look, look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. If you'd open your Bible, go backwards with me. I think this is important. Look at Deuteronomy 6, look at verse 10 with me. 
And this is the warning that God has given Israel. Watch what it says. So it shall be. When the Lord your God brings you into the land in which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hoon out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. You shall take an oath in his name. You shall not go out after other gods and the gods of the people who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Now, th th think about what God, God is telling him. Look, guys, when I give you all these things, when, you, when you're blessed beyond measure, don't forget me. Because the tendency is that when we're comfortable and we've got everything going for us, it's easy for us to forget him. And it's exactly what he's warning the children of Israel about here he says whenever you guys grew fat whenever you grew thick whenever you became obese watch what he says then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation there in verse 15 in verse 16 he says they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger they sacrificed to demons not to God to gods they did not know, the new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear of the rock who begot you, you were unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. Wow. How many descriptions does he give in, in the way that the children of Israel were responding to God in that passage? They forgot God. They, they scornfully esteemed God. They provoked him they sacrificed to demons they were unmindful they had forgotten god and and the, the, this, this whole song it, nothing remember it's a song that they're that they're learning it was it was to be a constant reminder to them that when you know when we're in the land and we have a, an abundance and we have plenty that we're singing this song that reminds us that we're not to be doing these things that would provoke God and in the 19th verse we start to see God's response to their actions then God begins to to tell them how he feels about what they were doing as they had forsaken him and provoked him watch what he says in verse 19 and when the Lord saw it He spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I hid my face from them. I will see what their end will be for they are a perverse generation. Watch this. Children in whom is no faith. Wow. You see, God's evaluation of them because of their action. He's saying, guys, th this is the real issue. You guys have no faith. Because what does faith do? Faith believes truth and acts upon that truth. And the problem with the children of Israel is that they, they had forgotten who God was. They had, they had forgotten his power, his might, his deliverance. And it says, you guys have come to a place in your life where you no longer trusted me, where you no longer desired me. That's a lack of faith. In God's view of them, he says, look, what, what you guys have done is you have not only lacked faith, but it's interesting, God's response, he goes, now I'm going to hide my face from you. You're not going to see me anymore. I'm not going to be in your presence as a result of it. You see, guys, God's longing to fellowship with us. That's God's heart. That's because like God created you for himself. But when we begin to 
push God out and begin to pursue other priorities. When we begin to have other pursuits, we sin against God, against what we know to be true, then what you're really doing, you're saying, God, I choose this over you. And God says, whenever that's the case, I'll hide my face from you so that you don't know me, so that you're not in my presence. And God is warning the children of Israel. Look at it says in verse 21, and they provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. Guys, God can be provoked to jealousy. You, you know, I, I think in our culture we're taught jealousy is a bad thing. Jealousy is a good thing when it's concerning God. God's jealous of you. He doesn't want to share you with the other gods of this world. He wants you exclusive with him. He pictures it as a bride and a groom. You're, you're the bride, he's the bridegroom, and, and he, he doesn't want you cheating on him. He doesn't want you going out with other gods that are false gods. He wants you committed to him. And he says, look, I, I was, you guys provoked me to jealousy. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols, verse 21. But I have provoked them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation for a fire is kindled in my anger and I shall burn to the lowest hell. It shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap disaster on them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence and bitter destruction. I will also send against them the teeth of beasts and the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and the virgin, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs I would have said I will dash them in pieces I will make the memory of them to cease from among men had I not feared the wrath of the enemy lest their adversary should misunderstand lest they should say our hand is high and it is not the Lord who has done all of this now, now God's saying if it wasn't for my character my reputation I would have, I would have just wiped you guys out God was going to bring a consequence. And there's, there's always a consequence to sin. It, 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 an interesting passage that Moses is, is mentioning here because he says, look, it's going to be the sword that's going to be against you. It says the sword shall destroy outside. Now, there's an interesting story in First Chronicles where King David had started to number his army and God had told him not to number the army because his confidence wasn't to be in the arm of flesh but in the Lord. And he starts to number his army to see how big his army was and how strong his army was. One of his chief soldiers came to him his generals and said look David don't number the army you know God's blessed you with a huge army you don't need to number him and he goes no no I want to number my army and he right when he finishes numbering the army Joab comes and tells him the number and then the Lord sends a prophet to David he says David I've given you all the victories and now you want to put your confidence in the size of your army he goes, that, there's going to be a consequence for that. And he says, you got a choice. There's three things I'm going to do. I, I'm going to either bring a plague on the land or a, a, a famine on the land or there's going to be, your enemy is going to come and destroy you or I'm going to bring a plague. So it was a famine defeated by the enemies or God will bring a plague for a few days. And, and David goes, Lord, I don't even know what to choose. 
I'm just going to fall on your mercy, whatever you choose. And God brings a plague and 7,000 men die because of David's sin. And David begs the Lord, you know, Lord, you know what? I'm the one who sinned. Why are all these people dying? It's my fault. It should, it should come on me. And it tells us that there was an angel that pulled out his sword and he was in the heavens was bringing the plague upon the land. And David went to the altar and he sacrificed on the altar and the plague stopped and it says the angel took his sword and he put it back in his sheath. There was something happening in the heavens that affected the natural. And it's in this passage, I, I think this whole picture, you know, is, is really unfolded. You know, guys, what, whatever happens in the natural is somehow affected in the, in the heavens. God sees what's going on in our world. He's in control. And he's telling the children of Israel, guys, is, is, uh, as long as you were following me, think about the blessings that I brought upon you, you know, the, the provisions that I'd given you. But when you turn your back on me, don't be taken by surprise when the plagues and, and, the, and the famines and all of the, you know, the craziness happen amongst you. And it's amazing because God is warning them because he loves them. Because he's jealous for them. He, wa he, wants, he wanted this, this relationship to go far. Now look, look, at, look at the next verse. And this, this is what's incredible. Look at verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise and that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Now, now here, here's, here's what God is telling them. If you guys would just think this through, if you would just consider what I'm trying to tell you, you see, God's telling them because he, he wants to warn them before they go down that road. And if you would just consider your latter end, and I think all, mo, continuously, in multiple occasions, Jesus does that same thing to us. He's saying, consider the end. You see, that this life is temporal. You know, you, you're going to be here 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Some of you, maybe, you know, 90, 100. But one day, this is all going to end. And we're going to stand before God. And we're going to give an account for our life. And if we would live our life with that in consideration, it would guide us. It would be a wise thing to do. And as God is instructing the children of Israel, he says, you know, be wise. Consider. the consequences and the blessings the choices that you have to make and, and all of this is prophetic you see none of these things have happened yet God is telling them for future he's saying look this is, this is what would happen if you would consider the consequences then you would make wise choices and then watch this look at verse 30 how could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? He's saying, consider all that God, had, God has already done for you. How is it that one man put a thousand to flight, that two men put two, ten thousand to flight. You see, God had given them victories that didn't 
make sense. They should have been defeated by their enemies. They were outnumbered. They were outgunned. They had chariots that that were way more advanced and powerful than anything the children of Israel had. But God had delivered them. It didn't make human sense. It was supernatural. God's protection and provision for them was supernatural. And, and, I, and I love that term there, unless their rock had sold them. And you know, he's our rock. And Moses makes reference to that on multiple occasions. He's our rock. Remember when Moses struck the rock and water came out of it and God rebuked him for it? Because the rock was a symbolism of of God and and Moses is misrepresenting God as God is an angry God and, and God wasn't angry. He's our rock. And what's incredible in this whole picture is there in verse 31, watch what he says, For their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and their fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents, and their cruel venom of cobras. Now he's saying their their gods are fake. Their gods are just poison. Their rock isn't like our rock. Our rock is glorious. His character is flawless. Everything they're pursuing after is, is, you know, vain. It's empty. But our rock, he's the one who brings victory. And then watch what he says there in verse 34. And this is cool. Watch what he says. Is this not laid up in store with me? sealed up among my treasures vengeance is mine and recompense their foot shall slip in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand and the things to come hasten upon them for the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there was no one remaining bond or free And he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise and help you and be your refuge. And here's what God is saying. When it's all said and done, man, their rock is going to fail them and our rock is going to bring great victory. Consider it. Consider it the end of it all. Consider how God, the creator of heaven and earth and, and everything that he's declared and everything he's instructed, he's given you his wisdom, he's given you his heart, he's given you his word it's so that you can live a life that's, that's prosperous, that's, that, that's purposeful. But their rock, it's going to fail them. Everything that they're pursuing after, all of their pleasures and all of their passions and all of the things that they're they're elevating it, it's all going to come to an end one day and everyone's going to stand before the lord and he's the judge now if we would just take that into consideration it's just logical conclusions you come to when you come to this place where you say you know what i, I, I can live my life for this world i can live my life for me or i can live my life for god which, which one really is going to have a better ending? Which one's going to produce a better result? Just logical. I, I would, I'd rather live my life for the Lord, even if it means a, a harder path or a more difficult road. I'd rather live my life for the Lord because I know that the end result is going to be I'm with him forever. You see, the result of their life, it's all going to come tumbling down. 
And so he's, he just, he's, he's trying to reason with the children of Israel. Look at verse 39. This is a great verse. Now see that I, even I, am he. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. Now, what, what, what an incredible revelation that God is bringing to the children of Israel. Look, I'm he, I'm God. And there's not another God besides me. There, there's, there, you see, everything else is created. All of the demons that they were worshiping, all the false gods that they were sacrificing to, those were created beings. But God, he's the creator. He didn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. Everything came into existence by his word. He spoke it and it was. You can't compare the two. It's not even the same league. Satan was created and he rebelled against God. You see, everything that they were worshiping was created by God when you can be worshiping the creator God. And, and what's, what's amazing is, is God's reminding them, there's no God besides me. I'm the only God. There, there's gods with a little g, but they're not God. They're not, they're not the one who have complete sovereignty. And so he reminds them, I'm the one who kill. I'm the, I'm the one who makes alive. God's the one who gives breath. And God's the one who has the, the control to take that breath away. God is the one who wounds and he's also the one who heals. Notice what he, what he says in the next verse. There is no, there, nor is there anyone who can deliver from my hand. You, you can't win against God. You can't defeat his purposes you can't overthrow his power or his plan and he's and he's and he's reminding them look you know think consider whose side you want to be on and then verse 40 for i raise my hand to heaven and i say as i live forever if i wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment I will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrow drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives and the heads of the leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people wow guys you know I, I think sometimes we want to think of God as you know God's love and he is love he, he's the definition of love but we neglect to realize that God is also the judge he is going to declare right and wrong and he's going to pay a reward to those who choose to follow him and there's going to be a consequence to those who hate him he's the one who's in control not us and in verse 43 is an interesting passage because remember he's all of this was writing to the nation of Israel to the Hebrew to the Jewish people but he says rejoice O Gentiles now because God is who he is as Gentiles we can also rejoice because he's a gracious God and a merciful God because his promises are true and he's going to do what's just 
He's going to do what's fair. He's going to do what's right. And as Gentiles, you and I can have confidence that God is going to do the right thing in every circumstance and in every situation. And so we, along with the Jew, we rejoice in the God of our salvation, our rock. And he's the one who sustains us. Now, incredible because, you know, think, think about what's happening here. Moses is giving his last words, and that was the end of his song. If you want to memorize a song, that's a great song to memorize. I'm going to go around singing chapter 32. <laughs> Now, you know, the, the stanzas in that song are, are quite long. But I tell you, the message is quite clear. That God is the one who's on the throne. And God is going to bring about his purpose and his plans for the nation of Israel. And if you choose to rebel against him, he'll give you the, the latitude and he, he will allow you to do that. But you need to understand that you're making a choice that's in, to, to your own hurt, to your own, to your own demise. But notice what he says in verse 44. So Moses came with Joshua, the son of Nun, and he spoke all these words of this song in the hearing of the people. Moses finished speaking all these words to all of Israel, and he said to them, set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe. All the words of this law, for it is not a futile thing for you, because it is your life, and by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. Now, it, you know, once again, reminding them, everything I'm telling it's not futile. To consider these things, to meditate on these things, to take into consideration the things that God's trying to tell you. That's not a futile thing. It's an important thing. You know, something that's, we do a lot of futile things in life. Sunday night, I, I watched three hours of a football game that I'll never get back. Futile. <laughs> Great results, but it was futile. And you know, we, 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 we do a lot of things that have no meaning, no value. You get done with it and you go, okay, well, you know, what was the purpose of that? But it's not futile to hear what God has to say. It's not futile to, to daily sit down and say, God, what do you want to say to me today? That's the only thing that has value. You can sit down and watch a half hour sitcom or you know sit down and watch, watch news for how and you know you get done with that time and it, it really it didn't make you any better <laughs> but you sit down a half hour with God's word and it transforms your mind it begins to give you God's heart and you begin to you begin to line your thoughts up with God's thoughts matter of fact Romans says it like this chapter 12 he, he, where he says do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God. And it's the renewing of your mind that gives you the ability to be in line with the heart of God and the will of God. And the only way you know to, you can renew your mind is if you take the, the mind of God and you begin to place that into your mind, into your heart. And with, is Moses' encouragement to the children of Israel, he says, it's not a futile thing for you to, to read his word, to meditate on his word, to consider what his word says because it is your life. It's your life. It's going to really dictate to you which way in life you're going to go. And so it becomes not a futile thing, but it becomes a necessary thing. I like what he says there, and by this word you shall prolong your days. It's the word of God. It's going to give you long life. It's going to give you wisdom. It's going to give you the ability to, to make right decisions. 
as a young man, you're, you're able to guard your heart and you're, you're able to, to know, you know what right and wrong is. You know, I, I remember growing up as a kid, my mom would always tell me, read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs where wisdom is. And I, I remember as a, as a young man just reading Proverbs chapter one and chapter two and just day, there's 30 days in the month and there's 31 Proverbs. Perfect. A proverb a day. I, I encourage you young men and young women, you know what a proverb a day would transform your life because you're going to get wisdom you're going to learn things that the world's never going to teach you but God wants to teach you and it's going to prolong your life it's going to give you the ability to make right choices in life and I, that's just not young I, I think you know old as well that we need wisdom and so he, he, he encourages them that man these are the things that are going to guide you as you go into the Jordan then verse 48 it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up on this mountain of the Abarim, Mount Nebo, which is the land of Moab, across from Jericho, view the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession, and die on the mountain which you ascend, and be gathered to your people just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin because you did not hollow me in the midst of the children of Israel wow consequence for sin even for Moses he says Moses you're not going to the promised land because you, because of what you did is a misrepresentation of who I was and so you're going to go up to the mountain. And, you know, it, what, what an incredible picture. You know, Moses, go up to the mountain and die. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> go die. And he's going to go up to the mountain, and, and, and he's, he's going to die on that particular mountain. And, and we won't get into it next week, until next week, and, and there's no way I'll finish. But he, here, here's what's interesting. Moses goes up to the mountain, and he dies. And it says that God buried Moses' body. Very, very interesting because, and we'll look at it next week, but the New Testament tells us that Satan was looking to embody Moses' body to deceive the children of Israel. And so God has to hide the body of Moses so that he doesn't come back with a different spirit and deceive the children of Israel. It's interesting how the Satan is constantly looking to deceive. And he will use any means possible to accomplish that end, to deceive us. And yet God was, was there to, to protect them. But it, it's just an interesting passage because he's telling Moses, Moses, you're going to go up on that mountain and you're not coming back down. You're going to go up on that mountain and, and you're, you're going to die on that mountain, but you're going to get to look at the promised land that I promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And you're going to lay your eyes on it. In chapter 33, he's going to give a blessing to the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, before he dies, to his 12 sons, and, and those were the 12 tribes, the sons of Jacob. And before he dies, he gives each of the sons a blessing. Now Moses is going to do the same thing, not to the individual son, but to the tribe as a whole. And so he's going to, in chapter 33, he, and we won't make it all the way through, we'll, we'll take a couple of them, but it, it's, it's incredible because Moses now go, is going to make his way up to the mountain and he's going to get a view of all the land. And he's going to talk about each of the different tribes and, and how God would have his hand upon those tribes. Look at verse 52 now. Yet you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go there into the land which I'm giving to the children of Israel. Chapter 33. Now this is the blessing by which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran and he came with ten thousands of saints 
From his right hand came a fiery law for them. Yes, he loves the people. All of his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Moses commanded the law for us, a heritage from the congregation of Jacob, and he was a king of Jeshurun. Then he, a leader of the people, were gathered in all the tribes of Israel together. Now, it's amazing because he's recounting how God had taken them from nothing. God had brought them out of 12 sons. He makes a nation. They go into captivity with 70 people and they come out with a several million people. And God leads them and guides them and protects them. And, and Moses, you know, was the one who was giving them instructions as God would give Moses instruction. And, and he says, look, everyone received your words. They, they were being guided by God. They were being led by God. They were being instructed by God. For 40 years, the children of Israel we're in a different relationship with God than any other nation had ever been in. They would see at night when they went to bed. Can you imagine every night you go to bed and there's a pillar of cloud? I mean, a pillar of fire. You couldn't see the cloud at night. That's why it wasn't there. It was a fire. And every night you would know God is there. And then in the morning, it would turn into a pillar of cloud. And the, every morning, they would know that God is there. And whenever the cloud moved, the children of Israel would move with it. And whenever the cloud stopped, they would set up camp. It was God guiding them and directing them. And this new relationship, as they were about to go into the promised land, they, they were to, now they had the instructions from God. And they had his word. And if they would just live their life according to the word. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we'll begin the book of Joshua as they cross the Jordan into the promised land. As they go up against Jericho and God brings great victories to the children of Israel as they are just, you know, depending upon God. For everything. And as he begins the blessing upon these different tribes, he, he, he's just going to really, um, for some of them, just really, really, really short and sweet. Some of them he's going to give some greater detail. And there in verse 6, he begins with Reuben. He says, let Reuben live and not die, nor let his men be few. It's a pretty simple blessing. <laughs> I, I, I like that one. Let him live and not die. That's, that's good enough for me. Right? <laughs> Old Reuben was, you know, just, it, he was one of the tribes that was going to stay on the other side of the Jordan because he didn't want to bring his family into the promised land. And so he's saying, God is going to keep you alive, Reuben. He's going to have his hand upon you. You're still going to be a blessed man. Look at verse 7. And this he said to Judah. Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah and bring him to his people. Let his hand be sufficient for him and may you be a help against his enemies. Now, what's interesting is that Judah was the one who would always lead into the battle. They were, they were the ones who would take the front lines. It's interesting that Moses would, would pray, God, keep them in the middle of his enemies safe. And so Judah gets a blessing. Now Levi, now we all know Levi was the priest and the ones that were caring for the tabernacle. These were the guys that were the ministers amongst the tribes. And to Levi he says, let the Thuman and, the, and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa. 
and with whom you contended at the waters of Mirabah, who save his father and his mother, I have not seen them, nor did I acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they have observed your word and they kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the, lo the loins of those who rise against him and those who hate him, that they may rise not again. Now, you know, remember, Levi was the, the ministers. They, they, they were, you know, caring for all of the needs in the tabernacle. And he's saying, God, you've seen their heart and their service. And God, would you bless them for doing that? Would you provide for them as, as they, you know, dedicate their life to serving? And now Levi would never get a portion of the land. They weren't part of the inheritance. Their inheritance was God. And they would be living around the places of worship. And they were there to serve, but they would never get their own chunk of property their own piece of land because they were to be dedicated to the service of the lord and it's interesting that he gives them a blessing that the work of their hands would be acceptable now he goes on to benjamin and benjamin he said the beloved of the lord shall dwell in safety by him who shelters him all the day long and he shall dwell between his shoulders. That's a good blessing, isn't it? I, you know, it's incredible just to have the safety of God. Just to have the shelter that God provides. And then you're dwelling between his shoulders. You know, there's a safe place to be, isn't it? Just... God's presence and God's hand upon Benjamin and, it, and, it's, and it's an incredible picture as he's reminding uh, you know the children of Israel of really what, what, what's valuable in life that you're in God's presence it's the best blessing you can ever have you know all of the wealth of this world is never going to satisfy you. the presence of God will God's hand upon your life and that's where the blessing's at. And is, we'll, we'll take one more. Look at Joseph. Look at verse 13. He's a long one. Blessed of the Lord is his hand with precious things of heaven, with the dew, the deep line beneath, the precious fruits of the sun, and the precious produce of the months, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of the everlasting hills, with the precious things of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. Let the blessings come on the head of Joseph, on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. His glory is like a firstborn bull. Now that's glory. His horns like the horns of a wild ox. Together with them, he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. You know, you know th this whole picture of, you know, God's blessings upon them as they go into this promised land. You know, one more, one more. We can do it. I got time. Look at Zebulun. Rejoice, O Zebulun, in your going out, and Ishakar in your tents. They shall call all the people to the mountains. They shall offer sacrifice of righteousness for they shall partake of the abundance of the sea and the treasures hidden in the sand. Now Zebulun. In the area of Zebulun, many in recent times have been looking for the cache of oil because of this passage the, the treasures hidden in the sand and there you know there, there's you know the the ones that are looking for liquid gold they read this passage and they go look it says there's treasures in the hidden sand of Zebulun and they're out there you know looking for and drilling for oil in in the land now 
it's interesting that they haven't found it yet. <laughs> There's another passage a little later where it talks about the oil in, in another area of Israel. And, and in that particular area, the olive trees are in abundance and there's a lot of olive oil and so they're digging for gold and I think it's all above ground not below ground but there is in the last couple of years been caches of oil that they found off the coast that they're saying it is such a pocket of oil that it's going to change the whole game when it comes to Israel's wealth. They're searching for oil where the Dead Sea is and they're saying if Israel hits oil there because it's at the lowest part of the earth that they're actually going to take the oil from Saudi Arabia that one cash is going to just, you know, drink and, you know, that's going to cause some issues. But it's interesting that all of the blessings that God is describing to the nation of Israel are blessings that to this very day are evident you guys we're, we're looking at one of the most fertile pieces of land on the face of the earth it's the most sought after the most fought for piece of land in all the world it's a blessed land and it's got a blessed people in the land because God has had his hand upon them. Now, for 1,900 years, they were dispersed among the nations, but God brought them back into the land because of his promises. Because God never goes back on his promises. And, and it's amazing, even though in their rebellion against God, God is still faithful. And, and even though they've had to pay a great price, there's been a great consequence. And, you know, it, it just... You, you, you look at that and then you look at the character and the nature of God in our own lives. I mean, think, think about how rebellious you've been against God. I've been against God. And yet God is with open arms waiting for us to come running to him. And the moment we do, he's there to say, I forgive you. I restore you. I wash you from everything you've ever done. All the, all the stains and all of the, the, the spots and all the wrinkles you've put on your life because of sin. I, I'm willing to, to wipe it all away. Because he's a gracious God and he's a merciful God. And yet he warns his children because he loves them. And so much of what, what the Lord has, you know, laid out with the children of Israel, I, I think it's just a picture for, for all of us just to come back and go, man, if God is that gracious to them, then that's his character. And he can be that gracious in my life and in my circumstance and in my situation if I just call upon the name of the Lord. And it's such a, a cool thing. I, you know, you guys... If you've been with us for the last two years, we've taken the first five books of the Bible. And we've, verse by verse, have gone through those. And, and we'll, we'll finish up next week with Deuteronomy and then starting into Joshua. But there, there's something that happens as you're hearing God's word on a consistent basis. It begins to transform who you are, how you think, how you see the world, and if, even more importantly, how you see God the gracious, merciful God that he is.